John Mills Hamill is an American political scientist known for his theory of offensive realism. While favoring liberal democracy at home, he's a fierce critic of the policy of liberal hegemony, the type of foreign policy the United States has pursued since the end of the Cold War. His most recent book, The Great Dilution, Liberal Dreams and International Realities, examines the effects on contemporary international relations. So how does he see the unfolding of the current world situation with multilateralism and globalism under attack? How is U.S. policy different as practiced by Donald Trump? And what relationship does he see between the world's two biggest economies as China continues to become stronger? To talk about these and other issues, I'm very happy to be joined today by John Mears Hammer. Later on, when we come back in the second part of the program, I'll be joined by Professor Xie Tao from the Beijing Foreign Studies University. That's our topic. This is a Dialogue. I'm Yang Rei. Welcome to Dialogue, John. Do you believe there's going to be a serious discussion about how to live or coexist peacefully between the two countries or two militaries? Well, I think because President Trump is up for re-election in 2020. He has to make sure that the American economy is doing very well. And a trade war with China not only threatens to damage the Chinese economy, but the American economy, and therefore threaten his chances of getting re-elected. So I think he is interested now in calling a truce to the trade war to help him get re-elected. But I think if he gets re-elected, he'll go back to uh, reinitiating the trade war with China. I think the United States and China are going to compete uh, quite intensively at the economic level for the foreseeable future. You are known for being a hawk, a super hawk, for being uh, known as a liberal offensive or offensive liberalism. What do you make of uh, your own theory and its impact upon the future of U.S.-China relationship? Well, I'm not terribly comfortable being called a hawk. Uh, I'm actually quite dovish on a lot of American foreign policy issues. I was opposed to the Iraq war. I'm generally opposed to America's interventionist policies all over the world. But I believe that whenever you have two great powers, like the United States and China, and one is the dominant power, and the other is the rising power, and of course that would be China. It is inevitable that those two countries will clash with each other. And it's because of the structure of the system. It's not because of anything peculiar to the United States or anything peculiar to China. It could be Japan and Russia. It could be Germany and France. It just happens in this case that the dominant power is the United States. But, of course, the United States will do everything it can to maintain its dominant position. And this is why I think you'll have an intense security competition between the United well, States the and China. The security, of course, we have the military build-up, but we only have one aircraft that carries strike groups. And at the same time, President Xi Jinping says over and over on many occasions that it is, it is very important to have a co-prosperity and the community of shared future by executing what is called the BRI, Belt and Road Initiative, meaning in essence growing interconnectivity between different economies to make money together, to make peace together, instead of talking like you guys about inevitable confrontation between the rising power and the uh, existing power. I mean, this is nuts. The Chinese won't accept what you say as true. Well, the fact is that China has benefited greatly from its economic intercourse with the United States and the Western world. So have millions of American consumers from the cheap Chinese products. That's correct. But the problem that the Americans face is that China is growing more and more powerful. And it looks we like... We are a catch-up economy. Why shouldn't we go very quickly? And because the United quickly. States wants to dominate the world. The United <laughs> States wants to be the most powerful economic state in the world and it wants to be the most powerful military state in the world and it doesn't want China to be in a position where it is an equal or a superior to the United States. Does it mean the United States does not welcome the idea of a level playing field or 
fair trade or whatever that makes the world fair. It yeah. just wants to put America first unconditionally, absolutely. Of course the United States wants to put the Amer uh, put, of course American policymakers want to put the United States first. But the point is the United States does not want a level playing field. The United States wants to be the dominant state on the planet. Then what do you think of the efforts by President Putin and President Xi Jinping to rebalance the old world order that was shaped in the wake of the Cold War, I mean in the wake of the Second World War in particular, because uh, you have the emerging markets, you have uh, 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 other catch-up economies, they want to somehow rewrite a uh, world economic order that is unfair for the catch-up economies. Do you think uh, what we want from perspective of developing countries is utterly unfair? I think what China wants and Russia wants makes perfect sense from their point of view. It does not make good sense from the American point of view. The United States wants to be the dominant power. It wants to write the rules. And it basically wants to dominate the international order. And it sees China and Russia as a threat for that reason. Of course, China is the greater threat. China has the capacity over time to challenge the United States. And the point I'm making to you is that the United States will rise to the challenge. No one is happy about the tough com competitions, particularly for the strong economies. However, China has made a steady contribution to up to 30% of the world's economic recovery. Despite the two uh, financial crises, either in 1997 in Asia or in 2008 that broke out in Wall Street. In the second case, China made enormous contributions I to agree the world. Completely. Uh, I agree recovery. completely. But why do you still adopt uh, somehow a hostile attitude towards China's rise and its global impact? Because no great power wants another great power to become as powerful That's or more powerful than it is. That's a discourse about something outdated, right? We live in the 21st century. We have so many mechanisms of peacemaking and China shows no signs whatsoever of occupying a single inch of the overseas territory. We didn't send any troops to invade any other countries since perhaps the border clash in 1979 during the Carter administration. Well, I make two points to you. Yes. First of all, and, and most importantly, uh, China is not that powerful right now. Mm -hmm. The question is, how will China behave as it grows more and more powerful? And the basic view of most Americans is that as China gets more powerful, it will begin to throw its weight around. It will build the Blue Water Navy. It will project power around the world the way the United States does. To protect does. prosperity and the peace, why not? My point is that the structure of the system considerations regarding the balance of power in the world and what the balance of power means for the survival of states forces all states, whether you're talking about China or the United States, to want to dominate the system. And the United States now dominates the system and it wants to keep it that way. It doesn't want China to dominate the system. One American scientist came to China at the height of the Second World War, and she went to Yan'an, where the headquarters of the Chinese Communist Party, particularly the Eighth Root Army, was located. The American lady said, back it after uh, the war in my studio, in the studio where I interviewed you in 2015. She said, we got to have a sense of history, a sense of justice, and a sense of humor. By a sense of history, you go back to the Cold War, we divide the world, we divided the world ideologically. So we switched to the Soviet Union in the first part of the Cold War. In the second part, we took side with the Americans. Yeah. Okay, that's the implications of the Great Triangle. Uh, and then with the end of the Cold War, the Chinese uh, foreign ministry says, we would no longer use ideology to judge our position and China's national interests in diplomacy and international politics period. So what instead replaced w our pursuit in the Cold War was very practical uh, diplomacy to serve our domestic reconstruction. And 
later on by President Xi Jinping, Belt and Road Initiative. So it's just about peaceful reconstruction. And American, I mean, Africans welcome this, Asians welcome this, Latinos welcome this, Europeans, particularly Greeks and Italians, are talking smart about how you know, they would benefit from the BRI. Except for the United States, they say, oh, this is a zero-sum game. This is ridiculous, right? When the majority of the world welcome China's rise, and they like the dividends of China's rise, you guys talk about hostile impact. The fact is, the United States is extremely powerful, it's a jealous god, and it's going to go to great lengths to make sure that China doesn't get to the point where it is on a level, level playing field with the United States, to use your rhetoric. See, I think when you talk about how the Chinese have behaved over time, how they switched sides in the Cold War, how they acted during the 1990s... For the sake of survival. Yes, but I think what the Chinese did was they privileged power over ideology. And that's the way I think about the world. To me, it doesn't matter whether China is a communist country. I don't really care much about Chinese culture or American culture and whether they clash or not. For me, it's all about power. It's all about economic power and military power. And what's going on in the world is that China is rising at a truly impressive rate. This is a really impressive country. And it has a lot of people. And it's becoming increasingly powerful. And most people believe that as countries become more powerful, their appetite grows. Therefore, the United States is going to go to great lengths to make sure that China doesn't challenge it. You're right. Appetite may grow for good or bad. And we believe firmly that we aim and aspire to be a benevolent great power. Learn again a lot from your logic. Thank you for being with us. My pleasure. the current China policy, either by President Trump or his successors, do you think they're going to run the risk of losing China again this time? Damage would be far greater. With all the damage that the Trump administration has done to the U.S.-China relationship, it's going to take years at least, or probably a decade, or even two decades, for the two countries' relationship to recover. The Europeans make no secret that they don't like uh, American uh, uh, foreign policy. Europeans and the Japanese and other American allies, they do disagree with uh, the Donald Trump administration over the policy means. We are very happy to be joined in the second part by Professor Xie Tao from the Beijing Foreign Studies University, where Professor John Mills Hamilton has conducted uh, some of the academic research and delivered lectures about his uh, theory. Welcome to Dialogue, sir. So Thank what do you think of uh, the um, offensive realism that he has advocated so many years, and he never shows any signs of regret? Well, Zhang Lei, you have to understand that John Mearsheimer is the first and the foremost a theorist. He's an academic, and so he really, you can tell that he really sincerely believes in his offensive realism. And so he starts with some very simple assumptions, for example, anarchy in international system. And every state seeks to protect its own security, survival. And so you, when you put all these assumptions together, and he derives from those assumptions this ultimate goal of every major power, not small power, but every major power is to be a dominant power in the region and uh, hopefully in the global system. So he really believes in his theory. Like you said, over all these years, he's never changed his position. And if you follow his theory and uh, pushes his theory to the very end, and he would say, between the United States and China, it's going to be very difficult to have a peaceful coexistence. That's his prediction. Okay. We don't mind whether it's his theory or many similar-minded people in the United States share his views and the vision. 
we do mind whether these theories would be put into practice one way or another by President Trump or his successors. So what do you think of uh, uh, the adaptation of his theories to the execution of American foreign policy? Yang Ray, you raised a very important point. Yes, he is an academic, but his research has enormous policy implications for people in Washington, D.C. So I think you know, his theory does have a big audience among many of the hawks in Washington, D.C. So they say, look, this is a serious academic research. And his prediction is that between the United States and China, it's going to be very difficult for peace. And so, so they are, some of them actually really buy into his theory and began to argue an even more hawkish foreign policy vis-a-vis -vis China. So you're absolutely right. Then what should be the most reasonable response from the Chinese policymakers? Well, let me tell you a story. I had uh, dinner with uh, Zhang many years ago. I asked him, what is the weakness of your theory? He held a Zhao Zi in between chopsticks, looking at me, and paused for a long moment. And then he said, probably interdependence, economic interdependence. I asked him a few days ago, and he still said, yeah, probably interdependence. So he does admit that even though his theory predicts between two great powers and their conflicts are very likely, but he also says if you have increasing interdependence, not just economic, cultural, educational, and other aspects of independence, interdependence, sorry, and so that would reduce the likelihood of conflicts. Is he happy about China's BRI? Well, I don't think he's written that much about the Belt and Road Initiative, mm -hmm. um, but I would assume that if he starts with his theory and he would say the BRI could be viewed as a Chinese attempt to challenge United States uh, primacy in, uh, in Europe, in Central Asia, and in other parts of the world. Do you believe uh, there's a kind of a political theater back in the United States as a matter of domestic politics? So when Democrats take over, they're going to change uh, the very aggressive foreign policy, or the case would be even worse. I'd like to have your prediction about uh, uh, power changing hand in the White House and what it means for the U.S.-China relationship. After all, one year from now, we're going to have a major election that will decide a leadership change or President Trump is likely to s survive the current campaign of impeachment and remains the most powerful man in the world. I wouldn't say that a democratic president will make uh, U.S.-China relations worse Neither would I say that a democratic president would make the situation better. In my view, with all the damage that the Trump administration has done to the U.S.-China relationship, it's going to take years at least, or probably a decade, or even two decades, for the two countries' relationship to recover to where it was before 2017. Why? One way to look at this, you know, I'm an uh, um, um, academic, you look at American public opinion. It has turned decisively negative over the past two years, especially in the wake of the trade war. So it's easy to do damage, but it's very hard to recover, to turn back this kind of increasing negative American public opinion about China and the future of U.S.-China relationship. Perhaps it's a little bit too narrow to examine our bilateral relationship between the White House and Beijing uh, by only focusing on the presidency in the White House. Let's look at the European Union. Let's look at a third party. Uh, even many American partners and closest allies disagree with President Trump and perhaps disagree with uh, the unilateral policy, whoever pursues it, Democrat or Republican, uh, Europeans, make it, uh, make, um, Europeans make no secret that they don't like uh, American uh, foreign policy. Well, I, I partly agree with what you just said. Uh, there's some, some kind of uh, argument that Europeans and the Japanese and other American allies, they do disagree with uh, the Don Trump administration over the policy means, but they do not necessarily disagree with Donald Trump with the policy ends. In other words, many of these countries seem to have you know, jumped onto the bandwagon of Donald Trump. China is growing so powerful and uh, 
uh, because you know, China is different from us, and so we probably should keep China down. I think you know, many people in Europe and many people in Japan, other parts of the world, they seem to have been persuaded by the Trump administration's rhetoric. And so the, they say, okay, the Donald Trump, you know, stop using this kind of a toolkit, use a different method, but we do agree with your goal. And that's very dangerous, I would say. Let's look at what's going to happen in the next stage of uh, uh, foreign policy or bilateral relationship between China and the United States. Do you think uh, we're going to have a parallel world order, ideologically, financially, or scientifically? Because you know the hostile attitude by the Trump administration towards Huawei and the 5G. Uh, many in the West, particularly those in the European Union, argue that Huawei is the watershed uh, that marks the division, if not, the, if not raises the prospect of having a parallel financial and particularly scientific world order. Do you agree? That's perhaps what some people in Washington, D.C. wants to see, that uh, there are two world orders, one dominated by Washington, D.C., and one dominated by uh, China. But that's just a very, very narrow view. And I would not say it's shared by the majority of uh, policymakers in Washington, D.C. Uh, remember uh, in the 1970s, you know, when Richard Nixon came over to China, he wrote that very famous article about U.S.-China relationship. He said, you know, uh, he does not want to leave China outside the international community. I think, you know, China, number one, even if he wants to isolate China, it's in totally impossible today. China is, I would say, nearly completely integrated into the global economic That's system. It's an important part of the global supply chain. Ab absolutely, absolutely. Even you, you, today you go to Washington DC, talk to, you know, whether mainstream economists or not so mainstream economists, one fact they cannot deny, that China has been a major contributor to global economic growth. Mr. Craig Allen, Chairman of the yeah. U.S. Business yeah. Council. He said, Yao Rei, look me in the eye. When I talk to businessmen from both sides across the aisle, Chinese and Americans, they are very happy talking about how to make money together. But whenever the issue of uh, ideology surfaced, mm -hmm. boom, there will be a, an explosion of ideology. There will be an explosion of hostility. They would walk entirely in different directions. So what do you make of what he said? Right. Um, at the business-to-business -business level and people-to-people -people level, like between Professor Mearsheimer and me and you, we do not have any problem at all. We can talk to each other. We understand each other. At least we try to understand each other, right? But the once you have this kind of a hostile, poisonous, I would say, rhetoric from some decision makers in Washington, D.C., and among some corners of these ideological elites, especially people on the right-hand side in the United States, and that kind of a poisonous t a rhetoric uh, f infiltrates down, penetrates down to the public level. And that could slowly erode, undermine public support for U.S.-China relationship. That, in my view, is very dangerous. There was a policy debate in the United States 70 years ago as to who had lost China. Now, when we look at the implications of uh, the current China policy, either by President Trump or his successors, do you think they're going to run the risk of losing China again? This time, damage would be far greater. But that would be a very interesting uh, analogy. You know, back in the 1950s, it was the Republicans who were blaming the Democrats for the loss of China, right? And today, you see, uh, if, if this really become a debate, and this time, I think it would be the Democrats asking Republicans who lost China. And most Americans do not want to lose China, lose in the sense of uh, being isolated, completely delinked from China economically, commercially. Many Americans do buy um, Chinese products, and Chinese continue to buy American products. We are economically so interdependent. It's just uh, totally implausible at the moment to delink the two economies. You came back from the United States, and thousands of Chinese students and scholars came back from the United States, and they showed their appreciation for what they have learned there. Now, the issue is, that President Trump says, for the sake of national security, people-to-people uh, uh, -people exchanges have got to be limited, got to be restricted. Now, what does he mean? Uh, does it mean 
it's truly the beginning of yet another round of Cold War. This is actually a, a very worrisome trend, in my view. Uh, if President Trump continues to have this kind of uh, uh, restrictions on Chinese students and scholars going to the United States, that would actually hurt the American intellectual uh, you know, uh, development much more than it hurts Chinese development. And if you have more incidents of Chinese students being denied a visa, Chinese scholars being questioned, harassed by American immigration officials upon their arrival in the United States, that would really uh, you know, make the Chinese be more hesitant to go to the United States. And uh, in the end, that would kind of undermine the fundamental uh, source of public support for the U.S.-China relationship. And that's really worrisome. And I do hope that regardless who is going to the United States, who is coming to China, we should be open to this kind of a dialogue, like what you were, uh, did, uh, were doing just with the Professor John Mearsheimer. Uh, prior to the presidency of Donald Trump, uh, the Chinese authorities, and particularly policymakers, uh, kept saying, look, uh, trade and economic investment uh, would be the stabilizing force. Jing Mao Shi, Zhong Mei Ya Chang Shi, you know. But then when I went to Shangri-La Dialogue in Singapore, uh, some of the PLA guys told me happily, look, it seems the male-to-male ties would be the Ya Chang Shi, you know, would be the most stabilizing force, ironically. I mean, I felt quite confused. What's your take? Well, that, that, that's kind of a very uh, interesting twist um, on the current relationship, right? It's because people-to-people -people exchanges are being, uh, you know, halted or suspended uh, by many American institutions. And now, the two governments actually are working very hard to make sure that at the mail-to-mail -mail level, it's crucial that they have hotlines, they talk to each other to avoid any incidents, accidents in the sea, over the sky, and others, right? After all, what you just said is that in the between the two great powers, the military conflict is the last thing they want to see, at least at the moment. The military militaries would be the, the first to, to be hurt, but the last to be repaired. Yeah. That's uh, the most dangerous consequences. Thank you very much for being with us, Professor Shetal. Thank, Thank you, you for having me. Thanks a lot.